Okay, so Aki, thank you very much for the introduction. And I'd like to appreciate uh, Aki for providing the opportunity in this nice IPC webinar series. But the, my research field is not the dermatology, uh, but the mucosal immunology. And so today's talk, it will be focused on just the pathogenesis and of the inflammatory viral diseases. But I hope all of you follow or enjoy my talk. Recent several evidence have indicated that both the genetic predisposition, particularly intestinal immunity and intestinal microbiota, both contribute to the pathogenesis of the inflammatory viral diseases. So indeed, the complicated interaction between the intestinal immunity and microbiota contributes to the development of the inflammatory viral diseases. But between this microbiota and the intestinal immunity, as you can see in this slide, between this microbiota and the intestinal immunity, there exists a single layer of the intestinal epithelial cells. So we hypothesize that these intestinal epithelial cells have some barrier functions that separate the intestinal microbiota and the intestinal immunity. So in this liga, epithelial cells of the gastrointestinal tract are covered by the mucus layers. Compared with the epithelial cells in the stomach and small intestine, Epithelial cells in the colon are covered by the very thick mucus layers that are composed of the outer mucus layers and the inner mucus layers. So what is the outer and the inner mucus layers? So we, when we stain the microbiota and mark two mucins in the mouse colons, so actually that stain microbiota are really abandoned in the, this outer mucus layer regions. But when you see these inner mucus layers that are visualized with these Mark II mucins, these inner mucus layers <clears throat> are essentially free of this red stained microbiota. Thus, by the presence of this inner mucus layer, microbiota is separated from these host cells. So regarding this or the mechanisms for this separation of the intestinal microbiota and the host cells, general concept so far accepted was that this because this mucus are really slimy, this slimy mucus mechanically prevents the invasion of the microbiota. But I simply wonder if this is only one mechanism. So in this step, my PhD student do address these issues by focusing on the molecules that is selectively expressed in the large intestinal epithelial cells. So actually he found LYPD8 molecules. When we analyze mRNA expression of this LYPD8 in several tissues, LYPD8, is expressed only in the gastrointestinal tract, particularly in the cecum and the large intestine. So when we analyze the LYPD8 mRNA expression in the large intestine, LYPD8 is expressed in the epithelial cells, but not in the lamina propria cells. Thus, this LYPD8 is selectively expressed in the epithelial cells of the cecum and the large intestine. So he decided to analyze the function of these molecules. And then he generated monoclonal antibody against LYPD8 and analyzed protein expression of LYPD8. So mouse colon was fixed with this colonoid fixation method that can preserve the luminal contents and can be used for the immunohistochemistry. So in this case, LYPD8 was found to be highly expressed in the uppermost layer of the coronic gland. And further, this molecule was found to be secreted into the intestinal lumen. So to visualize the outer and the inner mucus layers, microbiota was also stained. So in this case, LYPD8 was found to be accumulated into this interface between the outer and the mucus, inner mucus layers. 
Thus, LYPD8 was highly expressed in the uppermost layer of the chronic gland and secreted and accumulated to the interface that are exposed to the microbiota. So this is a case for the mouse colon. We then analyze the human colons. In the case of the human colon, human colon was fixed with a classical PFA fixation method. So in this case, luminal contents were all washed out and this area she was seen just black. But when we see the LYPD8 expression again, this red stained LYPD8 was found to be highly expressed in the chronic gland, upper most layer of the chronic gland. But when we analyze the ulcerative colitis patients, LYPD8 protein expression was severely reduced. Thus, LYPD8 protein expression well correlates with the pathogenesis of the ulcerative colitis. So, our next question is the role of the LYPD8 in the colon and go back to the mouse studies and generated knockout animals. So again, in the case of the wild type colon, in, uh, bacterial free region can be observed just above the colonic layers. But when we analyze the LYPD8 knockout animals, let's stain microbiota attach or invade into the colonic tissues, although the Mark II mutants are normally present. Thus, in the absence of the LYPD8, bacteria became to invade into the colonic tissues, and these LYPD8 knockout animals were highly sensitive to the intestinal inflammation. So to summarize these LYPD8 studies, LYPD8 was expressed on the uppermost layer of the chronic epithelial cells and secreted into the intestinal lumen, chronic lumens. And then LYPD8 binds to the flagella of the flagellated bacteria. Actually, this, this kind of the flagellated bacteria are highly motile. And LYPD8 binds to this flagellated bacteria and suppress their motile activity. In the absence of this LYPD8, these highly motile flagellated bacteria invade into the epithelial regions, which increase the risk of the intestinal inflammation. Thus, LYPD8 is essential for the segregation, separation of the microbiota and the epithelial layers, and important for the maintenance of the intestinal homeostasis. Thus, intestinal microbiota, is present, are present within the intestinal lumen without directly attaching to the host cells. This kind of the separation is required for the maintenance of the intestinal homeostasis. But all of you know that these kind of the intestinal microbiota influence the host cell functions. In this respect, bacterial metabolites particularly short-chain fatty acids are well known to act on the host immune or epithelial cells. So we simply wondered if other bacterial metabolites also act on the immune cells. So in this regard, we focused on the unique subset of the intestinal myeloid cells that are characterized by the high expression of cx 3 cl one this CX3 cell one high myeloid cells are present just beneath the intestinal epithelial cells, extend their dendrite into the intestinal lumen, and directly uptake the luminal antigens, and subsequently activates the effector T cells. So my PhD student Naoki tried to identify the bacterial metabolites that is responsible for the extension of the dendrites of this XCXCCL1 positive myeloid cells. And he found that microbiota derived lactate or pilebate. This lactate or pilebate induced the dendrite extension of this CX3CL1 positive myeloid cells through the G protein coupled receptor GP alpha D1. So microbiota derived metabolites mediates the host microbiota interaction 
for the maintenance of the intestinal homeostasis. But our interest is the pathogenesis of the inflammatory bowel diseases. So we wondered if microbiota-derived metabolites are also involved in the pathogenesis of the inflammatory bowel diseases. So Hisako and Yuriko addressed these issues, and they first performed lipidomic analysis of the patients with the inflammatory bowel diseases, particularly Crohn's diseases. And they found that lysophosphatidyl serine. So if we, the concentration of the lysophosphatidyl serine was increased in the plasma of the Crohn's disease patients. So depending on the saturation status, there are at least two types of the lysophosphatidyl serine, but the concentration of the both lysophosphatidyl serine was increased in the plasma of the Crohn's disease patients. So in addition to the plasma, we also analyzed the uh, concentration of the rice phosphatidyl serine in the feces. So again, both types of the rice phosphatidyl serine was increased in the feces of the Crohn's disease patients. So this rice phosphatidyl serine was generated from the phosphatidyl serine by the action of the enzyme called phospholipase A, PLA. And this PLA was expressed in the host cells, and actually PLA was also expressed in some kind of the bacteria. Because lysophosphatidylserin concentration was increased in the intestinal lumen, so we wondered if this biosis altered the composition of the microbiota correlates with the increased concentration of the lysophosphatidylserin in Crohn's diseases and we performed the shotgun sequencing. And we found that in the Crohn's disease patient, actually Crohn's disease patients have the dysbiosis and you, in which the bacteria possessing the PLA genes was increased. And accordingly, concentration of the lysophosphatidyl serine was increased even in the intestinal lumen. So our next question, is this lysophosphatidyl serine, whether this lysophosphatidyl serine is involved in the pathogenesis of the intestinal inflammation. So we address this question using the mouse models. So immunocompromised lag 2 knockout animals, when transferred with naive T cells, they developed mild intestinal inflammation. And seven, 17 days after the naive T cell transfer, LysoPS was administered. Administration of this lysophosphatidyl serine induced severe weight loss rapidly and induced severe immunopathology, indicating that this lysophosphatidyl serine exaggerated the intestinal inflammation in this T cell dependent colitis models. So at this time point, 25, 20, uh, 21 days after the naive T cell transfer, we then analyze the T cell numbers in the intestinal lamina propria. So T cells, actually CD4 T cells were isolated from the colonic lamina propria and analyzed for the number of the interferon gamma producing Th1 cells or the IL-17 producing Th17 cells. So after the rise of PS treatment, the number of the interferon gamma producing Th1 cells or interferon gamma and IL-17 producing pathogenic Th1 cells was significantly increased. Thus, lysoPS treatment induced the increase of the Th1 cells and exacerbated the intestinal inflammation. So our next question is a lysoPS directly acts on this CD4 T cells. So we performed the in vitro experiment. Naive T cells were isolated and cultured in the Th1 polarizing conditions. And one day after the, this culture, lysoPS was added to the culture cultures. So addition of the lysoPS increased the number of the interferon gamma producing cells. So in this experimental condition, only Th1 cells were existing. 
indicating that this rice PS directly acts on the Th1 cells and activates the Th1 cells. So when we stimulated naive T cells with rice PS, this rice PS did not act on the naive T cell at all. Thus, rice PS just act on the Th1 cells directly and activates the Th1 cells. So we then analyze how this rice PS acts on the CD4 positive Th1 cells. And then we uh, try to identify the host receptors. So the host receptors for the rice PS was already identified. And these are the actually the G protein coupled receptors, such as a GPR34, P2Y10. And this is a pseudogene in the mouse and a GPR174. Among these G protein coupled receptors, when we analyze the expression of Th1 cells, P2Y10 was found to be highly expressed in the Th1 cells. So we analyze whether this P2Y10 is involved in the rice PS or pathogenesis. So we generated P2Y knockout and P2Y10 knockout animals and used this lag 2 knockout animal or colitis models. So lag 2 knockout mice were transferred with wild type naive T cells or P2Y10 knockout T naive T cells. So transfer of the wild type naive T cells induced the mild development of the mild colitis and they showed the uh, weight loss. But when transferred with a P2Y10 knockout naive T cells, nothing happens and this lag 2 knockout mouse are totally healthy. And up to the 20 days after the naive T cell transfer, Rice PS was administered. In the case of the lag 2 knockout animals transferred with wild type naive T cells, Rice PS treatment rapidly decreased the, their weight and induced very severe uh, pathologies. Thus, in the case of the wild type T cell transfer, Rice PS exacerbated the intestinal inflammation. But in the case of the lag 2 knockout animals transferred with the P2Y10 knockout naive T cells, rice PS treatment did not induce anything. Thus, rice PS act on the Th1 cells through the P2Y10 and worsened the severity of the intestinal inflammation. So I'd like to summarize. So in the Crohn's disease patients, they have the dysbiosis in which they increase number of the microbiota, which possess the PLA genes. And accordingly, concentration of lysophosphatidyl serine was increased. And this lysophosphatidyl serine directly acts on the Th1 cells through the P2Y10 receptors and further activates the Th1 cells, which leads to the exacerbation of the intestinal inflammation. So I'd like to acknowledge that these contributors of these studies. So actually the, uh, these studies are mainly performed on uh, Naoki and Liu and the, the Hisako, Hisako, Hisako and the collaboration with the clinical department of the Osaka University. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. A great talk and also the excellent and um, lectures and thank you very much professor kiyoshi takeda in a uh, uh, two questions from in a q a and a one uh can lypd8 be used as a probiotic oh yes so actually we generated recombinant lypd8 protein and already treated with the uh, colitis, col col colitic mice. So treatment of the LY, oral treatment of this recombinant LYPD8 rescue the development of the intestinal inflammation. So if we could generate uh, large amounts of the recombinant LYPD8, they can be used for the therapeutic approach. Okay. Is there any of the uh, clinical trial 
Or... Oh, actually, the, uh, we discussed with the pharmaceutical companies that the for the oral treatment, so many amounts of the recombinant proteins required, they say so. Uh, actually, at this moment, pharmaceutical companies are not interested in this approach. Okay. <laughs> and the second one is, we just say that the increase of lysopias depends on specific type of bacteria in the intestine. Oh, the yes. So, so I, I do not uh, mention exactly, but the particularly E. coli mm -hmm. possessing the PLA is specifically mm -hmm. increasing across these patients. Mm -hmm. So actually, there are several types of the E. coli. In, mm -hmm. When we analyze healthy controls, mm -hmm. E. coli do not possess the uh, these PLA genes. But mm -hmm. when we analyze the Crohn's disease patient, oh. E. coli possessing the PLA genes was increased. Oh. Mm -hmm. I guess that this kind of the E. coli have some pathogenic functions in Crohn's disease patients. Another question, do you think it depends on the diet or mostly yeah. in the microbiota signature mm -hmm. of each individual patient? Uh -huh. It's a very good question, but at this moment, we do not know how the dietary habits are correlating with this dysbiosis at this moment. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, very good and, uh, answer. Thank you very much.